Okay, our next panel is mental health, substance abuse, and brain development in juvenile offenders, effective new programs, and what the data shows. Our moderator and summary presenter is Dr. Jeffrey A. Butts, Director of Research and, uh, pardon me, Director of the Research and Evaluation Center at John Jay College, and I'll turn it over to Jeff. In the home stretch. Uh, I, I have about a 10 minute slide um, PowerPoint thing I want to do, and after I'm done with it, we're going to move the cart on which the projector is sitting. So don't worry about eye contact, we'll get it out of the way. So, the topic mental health, um, substance abuse, brain development I would think we should probably add the word trauma to that title. Um, these things to me all come in a bundle of issues, and they are. They're having and, and will continue to have a powerful effect on juvenile justice policy and practice and I imagine coverage and discussion and public understanding of the juvenile crime, juvenile justice issue. Um, but before we get into that, I want to try to clarify a couple things. Um, there's a lot of confusion in this issue. Um, if anyone here knows me or heard, heard, has heard me talk about this before, you know I'm, I can get irritated by this issue. And the reason I get irritated is because our language in discussing it tends to become sloppy. And the, the key element of the sloppy language is, and I'm not blaming journalism for this, I'm blaming us for this, we who feed you information. Um, we use the term system in a sloppy way. So people will talk about the juvenile justice system and then move on, and they don't clarify whether the message being sent is the same as the message being received because I may think about the system in a way that's totally different than the way you think about it. Um, and the big problem comes when people say the system, and what they mean is corrections. They mean detention and correction space and razor wire, and then someone else talks about the system, and they may talk about how hopeful they are for things getting better, um, and those two people are gonna argue without ever clarifying that the second person means not just probation, but human services, child welfare, the school system, they, they're thinking more large um, in a larger way about youth services and prevention services. So these two things happen a lot and it's had a profound effect on the mental health issue. But to begin, um, and I think um, Professor Scott described this earlier today, we have had a uh, revolution in knowledge about adolescents coming out of brain research. And I should also apologize, first of all, um, for trying to school you on brain research when I know very little about it. Um, because our, our brain researcher, um, Abigail Baird, was unable to be here today due to a medical thing. Um, so we were set up to have someone who actually knows about this tell you about it. Uh, but I can also tell you that I have four points about brain research. Um, and I was just telling Craig Schwalbe about this, that I developed these slides on a train one day because I called B.J. Casey, who's based here in New York, and said, I have to talk about brain research. And she sent me these four bullet points, which I've been using for about a year now. Um, and this, she's a very knowledgeable person, one of the best experts in the country on um, brain functioning in adolescence. Um, so I would trust her to, to, to uh, train us in this way. Th these are things that we now know from empirical research. These are not suppositions, they're not theories, they're not someone's notion. We now know from uh, brain research. Um, and many of these lessons come out of the functional MRI literature. So when you actually take brain scans and watch as people solve tasks and do things and, and watch which parts of their brain become oxygen enriched, you know that's where the brain function's coming from, so we know these things. We know that adolescence is dominated by peer interactions, and I love this one, novelty seeking, <laughs> um, also elevated consumption behavior. I remember not only from when I was a teenager, but from when I worked with teenagers, that drug taking behavior during the teenage years is um, irrational. Um, not irrational in the sense of skirting danger and taking risks because that's what they do, but irrational in the sense that kids will take drugs far beyond the point at which it becomes pharmacologically sensible to take that drug. Uh, and I, in my early parts of my career, I would often ask kids, especially like hallucinogens, I would say, how, how many did you take? Um, and they didn't, they didn't know about the effect of the drug, they just wanted more. So the whole premise of teenager is more. But the point from brain research also and from anthropological research is these behaviors during adolescence, as it says here, can be adaptive. In other words, that's how humans become independent, self-governing, and survival-oriented, is by taking these risks. 
Um, so it's not a mystery that we're hardwired to do that. The second point is that adolescents have poor self-control and emotionally charged situations. Um, anyone who's raising a teenager right now doesn't need to hear these bullet points, I'm sure. And they're easily influenced by peers and don't think through the consequences of their actions. Again, this is supported by those studies that look at brains firing as, as people are solving tasks. The third one, and this is where it gets more actual physically oriented. I mean, we now have proof watching brains work that this happens. Adolescence is characterized by rapid growth in brain areas governing pleasure-seeking and emotional reactivity. This is the short fuse syndrome. With much slower development in areas that support self-control and judgment. And this is the research that was cited in the Supreme Court opinions that changed um, juvenile law or criminal law around death penalty. We know that a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old functions pretty much in, adult, in an adult way if they're asked to solve problems, sort information, perform cognitive tasks. It's when they're asked to do things that involve judgment and assessment of risk and long-term risk that their brains are, are not fully developed until well into the teenage years and sometimes even into the early 20s. And finally, we also know from brain research now that adversity and stress can downregulate the brain systems that allow for adaptive behavior and upregulate the systems that can hijack the rational regions important in the brain for guiding choices and actions. And all that means is when you're experiencing a lot of stress and adversity, it's harder for you to um, have a balanced uh, cognitive functioning that you tend to react more um, in the moment emotionally and less deliberatively. So just imagine what that means if you're living in a neighborhood where you hear gunfire at night as you fall asleep. I would call that stress and adversity. Or contact with systems and school systems and everything else. So the very environmental stimuli we've been talking about all day make it harder um, for adolescents to have a good self-governing mechanism over which parts of their brain are firing, meaning which parts of their brain are they using to respond to the situation at hand. Adolescence is not a mental health disorder. Um, <laughs> Uh, when I talked at the beginning about the influence of mental health and all this brain research on juvenile justice, my big concern is our use of sloppy language. Um, the first example I gave you was what's the system, which part of the system are we talking about? And the other is as soon as you start hearing the words mental health, mental health disorder, psychiatric, diagnosable, the communication becomes problematic. Um, I talk a lot to public officials and when I hear a state legislator um, say things about mental health and juvenile justice, um, I can tell um, very often that there's not a, um, a, a deep reserve of understanding about those issues. And they're, hearing, they're seeing headlines about mental health and psychiatry and brain functioning juxtaposed with stories about juvenile crime and there's immediate conclusion that, oh, that's why all these kids are getting into trouble because they're disordered, they have mental and emotional problems. And that's very comforting when you're explaining to yourself why your detention center is full of youth of color and um, your own you know, Caucasian children would never be there because my Caucasian children are fine. It must be those other kids that have mental and emotional disorders. That's the communication issue which concerns me about this whole mental health thing. That's different than trying to elevate the level of care and concern and screening and attention to mental health problems, which we should do. It's when we take those numbers about the prevalence of mental health problems and turn it into explanation is the problem. So in anticipation of this conference, um, if you got the email with those links to the little one pager, one of the one pagers we did was on this issue and we summarized, or I summarized, some data um, that came out of an article that Craig Swalby, who's sitting up here in the blue shirt, um, did at Columbia University with his colleagues there. And they, pr they presented this data as academics are wont to do in a table full of tiny little numbers and Greek symbols and asterisks. And um, if you know how to read that table, it makes sense to you. But I'm a simplistic person, so I turned it into these graphs. If you can't read it in the back, can you read the label in the back? OK. These are prevalence numbers. And those tell you the prevalence of, um, and the clinicians here could straighten up my language. I would just call these diagnosable disorders or detectable disorders. The key here is the, those two blue lines show you that the prevalence of substance abuse, which is the teal colored or cyan color, how do you say that, line, the light blue color, and the dark blue color at top is all mental and emotional disorders. 
Now, all mental and emotional disorders, of course, include those substance abuse numbers, and it's a big hunk of it. It also includes the um, favorite diagnosis James Bell mentioned, the conduct disorders. They are all in there. So anything that a psychologist would mark on a diagnostic tool is in that dark blue line. And it shows you that uh, juvenile justice intake, that's after the point at which a police officer has contact with a juvenile and taken them somewhere and said, here, you take this kid, whether that's a court or probation office, some kind of formal intake in, into the juvenile justice system. It's about one third of the kids, and, and by the way, this is, Craig can maybe tell us more detail, but this is not one jurisdiction, this is a lot of jurisdictions and a lot of screening that they did using the DISC, the D-I-S-C, it's a mental health and substance abuse screening tool. About one third of the young people that reach that stage of juvenile intake have some disorder that can be detected by that tool. When you move to the levels of detention and correction, it goes from 35 to 59 to 64. So suddenly you're at two thirds of the young people who have now moved on to the correctional stage or the placement stage. But that means a, you're looking at a much smaller pool. From the moment of arrest to placement in a correctional facility, you lose about 90% of all the kids that the justice system has had contact with. So maybe one out of 10 end up placed somehow. But once you're looking at those one out of 10, two thirds of them have these diagnosable disorders. And the two dots at the lower left are from a different study from another prevalent study that's not justice involved, those are just adolescents from a big city. And the researchers don't identify the big city, but they did screening on a, a general sample of kids that live in a city. And you'll see that 5% of just kids everywhere had a diagnosable substance abuse disorder, and 17% had some detectable mental or emotional disorder. And that does not control for economics or neighborhood or class. Um, it's just all young people. In between there, of course, there's the stage of arrest, and we don't have good data on, this, on the arrest stage, although I wonder, Craig, if you could split the sample, because some jurisdictions do basically do an intake on every kid that's arrested. So if you only looked at those jurisdictions, you'd come close to the arrest number. But in the national, the multi-jurisdictional sample, there's a hole there. We don't know about arrest. But I think even from those numbers, you can see that there's a, a gradual phasing up, gradual increase in prevalence of these these numbers as kids get further and further into, into the system. And the way I would describe this as we see mental health problems and drug problems in large numbers in the deep end of the system, not because mental health problems and drugs cause all crime, but because we sort and sift and choose which young people to divert and to handle outside of the justice system and which to file, adjudicate, play, dispose, and place. So it's all of the sorting and sifting that happens in the system that creates those higher prevalence numbers. And here's the problem in our sloppy language. Uh, and I know you can't read the small the gray print. This is an actual page from a report done by the National Conference of State Legislators last fall. The text that you can't read says, children with mental needs and sometimes enter a juvenile justice system ill-equipped to assist them. And then it says, between 65% and 75 or 70% of the two million children and adolescents arrested each year in the United States have a mental health disorder, which is flat out wrong. And I think what happens here is people get so used to saying the, the sentence that has the word system in it that probably they wrote the sentence initially specifying what parts of the system they were talking about and some editor thought it would be cleaner to simplify the language and just say arrested. Now, I, I'm sure none of you have had the experience of having an editor change your text and change the meaning. Um, but I'm saying that to excuse whoever wrote this original text, um, I assume didn't commit that grievous error. But this is what happens. So you have these data that I showed you before with the numbers going up, and then someone slips a, a synonym in. They say arrested as opposed to incarcerated or placed. And suddenly you have a message going out to state legislators that the vast majority of young people who are arrested by police have diagnosable mental health problems. And that's, that's the issue. That's where the communication problem happens. Uh, it's not causal, it's correlational. It's the sorting and sifting of why we have those issues. And the major problem, and this is not, this doesn't take a long time to figure out, but it's basically, we have one thing producing two different factors that tend to co-occur. We have social and economic disadvantages that increase the probability of a young person being involved in the justice system, and those very same things increase the probability of them becoming diagnosed with a mental health issue or a drug issue. 
I could show you data on that, but there's clearly a socioeconomic component to the probability of being diagnosed with a mental health issue and a drug issue. And those two things together create a lot of young people with diagnosable problems in the justice system. And it's our problem when we interpret that incorrectly and think what we're seeing is cause instead of correlation. 